So we're up and running. There's a whole bunch of things that can be good to know and look at, but we are, let's see, try and get everybody together. Everybody good here so that we have a nice big group. Awesome. So if you're in, in the room, you're able to see everybody, lots of people. We have a few people this week who are out and who are not going to be able to be with us because they're traveling, which is exciting. I hope that, that they're doing fun things and enjoying themselves. And it's always a good trick to, to be able to see people out and enjoying the world. So we're, we're gonna talk a little bit today about all sorts of things, but mostly about woodworking. And so it's good to get everybody together and let's see, making sure that we are recording, that everything's good and the audio is working. Uh, and it's 7.05. So try and stick to the seven o'clock, even when there's tech issues. And so we're going to hop in and get, get underway. The, for more, more people are remote than before, which is totally reasonable. I think that actually the Monday class is a good time to be remote if you're looking for when and how to do that. So feel free at any time you're on the audio in the space. So we should be able to hear you if you want to unmute and ask a question at any point. So you're, you're like just as much uh, with us together, even though you are far away. But you know, we're, we're virtually giving a big hug and glad that you're with us. The key is that we're gonna talk about the wood shop. And so we're gonna follow our standard format of first things first, we go through the notes, just because you know I, I'm very good at timing this to be talking for about an hour, it's what I do. And so we can hit this time mark fairly tightly and then afterwards we'll do our show and tell. So we'll talk about the badging process, we have a few tips and tricks for things to, to be productive this week. And so we'll talk about all of that sort of stuff and try and put it all together. Um, but with that, people at home, can you see the slides? You see the slide? Yep, cool. So we're gonna, we're gonna do you know 2.2. The first step is that most of you made some progress this week. Almost everybody got a few badges this week, which is really great. The badging process is one of the weirder, more cryptic parts of Make Haven for sure. And to get a few badges in to have seen that process happen is a really important part of getting engaged with this, with this community. And so we're, we're definitely looking forward to making sure that everybody is on the right track with that and that we're all, um, all doing well. And so we're good there. But what we really want to focus on this week is how do you actually get started with a project? Now that you've gotten a couple of badges, how do you get going? What are the first steps? And what does that look like? And we've really got a, we've got a few ideas here and a few more to go through uh, as as we develop. But we're going to talk about the floating wine bottle holder, which is that picture in the bottom left. It's just a board with an angle cut on it and a hole drilled in it. It's kind of a fun way to use the center of mass of the wine bottle to hold it, and it looks like it's floating in air. Um, or you know, you can take a slab of wood, surface it nicely on the top and bottom, and get some hairpin legs, or make hairpin legs in the next unit where we do metalworking. And you can make your own coffee table like from these first two units, which is a really fun trick. Or you can make charcuterie boards, cutting boards, picture frames. There's all sorts of things that fit into that camp where you're able to play along and, and do all sorts of things. A cool one that happened last year was one of the people in the class made a planter out of wood on the lathe. So it was like a little thing to hold some soil and a cactus. Uh, it was really nice. And they laser cut some letters into it later on. There's a ton of cool things that you can make, but we're gonna try and stay focused on some of these throughout, throughout today's talk. Um, so a big part of what we're gonna talk about today is sort of the narrative of how a woodworking project happens. What are the steps that you go through and how, and we're gonna think about it in these different phases of developing that, that project. So we'll start off with the planning phase, which is where everybody might be right now or, or getting to very soon which is how you plan or design the project, how you decide essentially what you wanna do. And from there, you can go from any sort of level of design where you have a plan, where you're starting to get ready to have real concrete, specific ideas about what that's gonna be. And you'll do some prep work, like making sure that the machines are all set up the way you want, making sure that you've got the material that you want, uh, getting, gathering your supplies. That's gonna be a big part of what we're doing. Then actually the cutting, which is its own whole step. 
And that's where most people think the woodworking lives is just in that cutting step. But really it's the prep and, and getting all the way through the process that does a lot of it. Then there's the fastening. How do you attach the pieces? And then finally the finishing. So how do you add color or stain or, or some sort of a protective layer? We're gonna work our way through this story arc with many different steps and look at all the different pieces and parts. Uh, and we've got lots of things to talk about. Ah, but one really important thing to talk about before I get too uh, out of track is we officially now, and I, I lost this, I apologize quite a bit, Ileana. I, it was the tech snafu that got me, but we're really excited that officially Ileana is our assistant instructor. And uh, Ileana was a foundation student last year. You all met her at the beginning. She's been here for all of our sessions so far. Um, but we're really excited to have more support for all of you as you're going through these projects. And so on Slack, you're just Ileana, right? Ileana, yeah. Ileana Garcia, maybe? And or just is it just, uh, or is it Anna? Oh, in Slack, it's just at Anna G. It's just here. Yeah, okay. So in Slack, it's Anna G. And so, and we can pull that up. But in Slack, she's Anna G. And if you have any questions, she's also fantastic. It's very much gone, gone through all the foundations things is good in the wood shop and can really, uh, the one thing that I'm really excited about with Ileana is she's very, very good at talking out ideas and helping. I have, I have had better ideas formed through conversations with Ileana. So it's definitely useful to have her as a part of our, of our little family, making sure that our projects get better and better by working through them and talking through those things all together. And planning, planning a project is definitely made better by being able to talk through things and have have those discussions early so that you can sort of anticipate the weird things that'll come up as as we're doing it. And so that said, we're going to actually start to make progress on the slides, I promise. But with that, the first step is planning. So as you're planning your project, you're going to think about what are the things that you need or want? What are the constraints to your project? Uh, and that can get really formalized if you're in an engineering device environment the needs and constraints are a big part of your discussion early on but for you know woodworking building a charcuterie or cutting board the needs and constraints are i need a cutting board and its constraint is i need to be able to lift it right or i don't want to spend too much money on it right those can be relatively straightforward but they're really important big parts of that are a mental picture of what your solution will be of what your final project will be some sort of an idea uh, a, back, a, a sketch, a drawing, a 3D design, any of those things all fall into this planning phase. And some people really can imagine whole projects in their head. Other people need to absolutely have it sketched out or drawn in one way or another. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a person that can, I don't have mental pictures at all. So I absolutely need to design them in some form or another, whether it's a sketch or 3D design. So there's lots of different ways that we can do this. But as you're thinking about designs, one big piece that we'll circle back to many times throughout the course is this design cycle. So as you're coming up with a solution for a problem, this design cycle is not uniquely ours. This was, I think, maybe originally a military invention. You wanna think about sort of what is the, what's the question that's driving you? What ideas can you generate to solve that problem? If you're building a footstool, let's say, hypothetically, uh, what you question like, what do I need my footstool to be? How do I generate some ideas about the footstool that I'd like to make? What could I build as sort of a test version of that footstool? What could I do to sort of play with that idea, get started with it? And then how do I evaluate that to see how it's going? Then if you want to, you could build a version and see if, it gets, see if it's what you want. You could build a better version and you could keep doing the cycle as many times as you want. But the idea is that each time you go through this loop, at the end, you hopefully have something that's useful. And each time you go through, it gets better and better and better. So instead of physically building, it's often much cheaper and faster to, do, to draw or design something. And so usually the place where people start is a sketch, a quick sketch. And an isometric sketch is a really classic way to draw things. It's this weird graph paper that has three different dimensions for lines. And it's meant to be the X, Y, and Z dimension of a drawing. Some people really love this drawing style. Uh, it can be a little constrained because of those lines. Some people love it. Some people love to hate it. It's not always for everybody. 
but starting to make sense of your designs with some level of sketch, whether it's on a napkin or on a sheet of paper or graph paper or whatever, it can be really, really helpful to just start to imagine those things. If you're, if you have a better idea or even a plan, you might get a plan, a model for a, for a project where you've got real specific cut lists or, or specific plans that you need to cut out. Sometimes you can take those into Inkscape and actually laser cut those plans. You can print them on our large format printer, which is a thing we'll talk about when we're, when we're talking about templating for fabrics, which is really cool. You can buy PDFs of like designs for garments and print them to actually sew them from, which is really neat. Uh, but in any case, if you have a design, some people will go so far as to draw out models like this, where they can really use that as a, as a guide for how they wanna make and cut their things. Especially, and I really like this image down in the bottom, if you have these cuts all planned out, there's different programs that will let you optimize the material use. So you can really get the most out of a sheet of plywood if you have all the cuts planned in advance, which is a neat, a neat trick. And then this is essentially how I almost always do designs. And these are projects that I've actually made um, or am about to make where I 3D model things. So what I find is that when I'm, and this is because I'm already good at 3D modeling, it's a skill that I have from years of practice. If I'm going to build something, like this is a table that I made for the school where I was teaching. We wanted to cut a table out of a sheet of plywood. And so I was able to model it really quickly in within like an hour and a half, that model came together. And I was able to see, does it fit? Does it work? How do the pieces click together? Where will I need to add fasteners? And so I was able to mock that up without having to spend any money on material. I was able to just do it in a digital space without doing anything else. My curved wood that I'm working on for a bar cart is this right here. This is the 3D model for it. And so I'm able to use this 3D model to build jigs and tools and plan out other cuts. Um, and for me, this is a really important part of the process. But this comes after years of skill with 3D modeling, but it can be a really helpful way to better understand. And then even more, you can play with this and get designs that come through and are very cuttable in this space right here. But that's, that's sort of the planning phase. Plans can look anywhere from the informal quick sketch done hastily or like a picture you find on Pinterest all the way up through a 3D model that's completely unique. Like that range is really wide and not all projects should be, you know, if I'm building a series of doorstops for classrooms or like a garage or somewhere where I would just want to keep the doors open, 3D modeling that is certainly excessive. So finding the right balance for what you're doing and, and how much you want to have it have it planned is really an important piece. But then once you've made it through the planning phase, it's time to start thinking about your prep work. And so how do you get all of these things put together? And a lot of this is really sort of things you do before you're, you're ready to make any cuts on a machine. And so this is where you find the materials that you want. You're thinking about those. You're doing purchasing. You're looking at um, letting wood acclimate. At some point in the, in the past, I had a house in Cleveland and I laid a hardwood floor across an entire, the entire second floor of the house. When you're going to lay a hardwood floor, you buy the wood and then need to let it sit in the house for a week or two so that it can come to the same temperature and moisture as the environment. If it's very different over time, that floor will start to warp in ways that you don't want it to. So letting wood acclimate can be really important, especially if you're buying wood that's not kiln dried or if you're buying things or if you have like a found piece of lumber, you may have to wait for months to let it dry. If you're like, if you cut down a tree and wanna make a, a thing out of it, you might have to cut it and let it dry out for a long time instead of just tree to table, right? It's gonna take some time to make that transition happen. Uh, squaring before shaping. We, a lot of you went through badges for squaring wood and that's a big part of prepping. Building templates and jigs can be really helpful and getting the tools together is, is important. Inside of our shared space at Makehaven, these are the things that I really wanna make sure that you think about just to make sure that you're on the right track. So the first one, if you're gonna use the joiner, check to make sure that the fence is 90 degrees. You can grab a square out of the fine woodworking cabinet. It should probably be at 90 degrees. Most people don't change it because that's about all it's good for. Uh, but if it gets adjusted or changed on the fly, it, it's worth checking, especially if you're gonna do a big expensive project. Same deal, check the table saw blade and check its angles. If you're gonna use a, a new blade, check its teeth, make sure that they're all there, make sure that none of them look especially chipped. 
that you're going to get a good cut. You can take a look that everything that you need is in the room. That's often helpful. And especially this is true back in the day when I was renovating the house that I was living in, having all the tools around and available, the more prep work you did for those jobs, the faster the job went. So if I was going to do the baseboards in a room, the more I could get the material ready, that I could get all of the things for the nail gun ready, the, the chop saw that I would need, all of that, the more you could prep it, the faster it would all go and the safer it would all be because you're not trying to find things and dig around and come in and out of the workspace. At, here at Make Haven, a big part of working in our shared wood shop is also keeping an eye on the other people in the room, making sure that if you have a goal and, and they're working on something, that if you're gonna cross paths, that you've sort of thought about it ahead of time and you're not like bumping into somebody being both being frustrated that you wish the other person was done. Uh, so thinking about the other people in the space can be really helpful, especially if you're moving big things around. Like a guy just walked by who's actually making a bed in, in the wood shop, which is incredible, but it's a very large project. And so it's awesome, but it's also very big. And so it was good that he was working on it when there weren't many people here. That would be hard to do in a, a fully crowded wood shop, but he pulled it off. Uh, cleaning up after yourself is a big part of being here. And then if anything breaks, whether you're using it or if it's broken when you walk up to it, letting, letting the staff know, putting a sign on it that it's broken is really important. Just to communicate out what's going on, because usually things will start to break and then they can really break. And if we can catch it before the really breaking happens, that's a good move. Um, and then you all might have other ideas for what are good strategies to employ on working in a shared space. And if you've got any tips or tricks, we'd love to hear them. So any other thoughts? Anybody have like immediate things jumping out at you for a shared space? What do you think, James? That's a good point. But the drill bits that you need and the router bits that you need are here and functional especially the, the router bits is an important one. Take a look at the router bits. And if they've got like a dark grime on them, it might be worth it to buy yourself a fresh one uh, because they do like, they need cleaned every so often. They're not wildly expensive. And so getting, making sure that all the things that you need are, are here is, is really helpful. The drill bits are especially important to check, I think, because they're easy to pull and hard to put back where they belong. So if someone didn't go to the trouble of putting them in the proper order, you might be digging for a little while. And if you can dig them out ahead of time before you get started, it just saves on frustration later on. Um, let's see, any others? What, any, Ileana? If you need to clamp stuff, make sure you have the clamps you need ahead of time. Because sometimes you think there's a bunch of clamps on the wall. You'll be fine. You don't have to pull them. And then you have to put your thing together. You turn around and the clamps are gone. So, oh, a little, a little louder. Oh, sorry. Then make sure that you've got all the clamps you need. Yes, make sure you have all the clamps you need ahead of time. Especially if you're gluing. You tend to need a lot more clamps if you're gluing. So... Uh, I just came across a point where I needed to clamp something together and I didn't, I had to use a much bigger clamp than I wanted to because all the smaller clamps were gone. It's one of those things you don't think about until you need it. That's part of what, you know, making sure all the tools you have are in the space with you. So you don't have to cut your session short or, you know, find a quick workaround at the last minute, which is always frustrating. Yep. Um, and then you, you can hold on to that one. Okay. So we got two. Uh, I also, if you're doing a glue up in general, so if you're gluing pieces together, from the time you pour your glue out, there's sort of a timer for how long you have to put the piece together. So just even if you think there's plenty on the wall and there's no one else in the room, it's not like they're going to disappear or go anywhere. Just having them nearby, so it's further fewer steps to get from where they are to where you want to put them, can be really helpful. So getting all of that prepped. Um, as much as you can ahead of time can be really the right move. Another thing that's really good for prepping, if you even if you think that you're going to be doing interesting cuts uh, using router bits like this, you can have some that are made much better, much faster, and much safer by having a template that you've made. And so if you're building something where you want to have a fun detailed edge, like this piece right here would cut, this has got a ball bearing there that you can ride along the edge of a template piece. 
So if you want to have, uh, and so you've probably seen counters or table edges that have a fun detail on them or molding or trim, they are cut with routers like this. And then these bearings right along the edge of that material and give you that fun shape. So if you wanted to do that, it's good to have these pieces and prepping for an entire project by building a template can make it so that you can rebuild it several times. If you wanna have repeated pieces, putting together a template can be a great way to get those repeated processes to work. Not all router bits have those parts on them, but it's really helpful to have them when you want them. Uh, and so usually you can stick on those with double-sided tape. I'm gonna share some videos with good examples of templating just so that you can see what some of those look like because it's really cool to see that done well and how well it'll work. Another thing that's really helpful to build, if you're building something with a lot of complicated angles, especially if we're talking about modern furniture with table legs uh, that, are, that are small and angular, building jigs to cut those angles consistently can be really, really helpful. Those are tools and things that you build out of usually relatively cheap materials that aren't your final project, but help you make that final project. And so building a jig can be a nice way to get a clean cut, especially on the table saw. In the table saw or in the space, in the table saw, you, you walk up to the one side and then on the back, there's an outfeed table. Underneath the outfeed table in our wood shop, there's a whole string of jigs that exist there already. There's spline cutting jigs, there's vertical cut jigs, there's all sorts of things that are there already as jigs that you can use. And there's some really neat ones that can be helpful for making sure that you get exactly what you want made. But if you have anything special in your project that you wanna do, building a jig to especially help you do it can be really great. For example, in my wood bending project to build that bar cart, I built a jig to help me hold the bent wood in its form after it's been steamed so it can hold and maintain that shape. So building a jig to get you headed in the right direction can be really helpful. So that brings us through planning and prep work. Our next step will be to think about how do you do your cutting? And so for cutting, we're gonna take a look at how this works and how to use this to, to do some, some work. While you're doing your cutting, oftentimes many people and most woodworking plans will have a cut list. And a cut list is really great if you have a design that has one. It says you wanna have this board, you wanna to cut to this length, and it takes some of the planning out of the work for you. So you can go from raw lumber closer to Ikea furniture, right? Where you don't have to be the one who did the planning. You just follow the cut list and make it work. My advice for you with a cut list is that always want to think about from the, the cuts, a, a great, a good work, work, good woodworker will use a cut list to plan out all their cuts and designs. A great woodworker will know how to modify that cut list so that they can get perfect fits from the dimensions that are there. Not thinking about it needs to be 11, inch, 11 and three quarters inches long, but instead thinking about it needs to fit from this piece to this piece. And how can I make a reference on the table saw so that it's exactly the size I want instead of being 11 and three quarters inch and hoping that that's exactly the right size. Because any cut you make might be slightly off, and if you can plan ahead enough that your plans work out that way, it can be a really good trick. There's lots of reasons why you'd wanna think about that, but one of them is to think about the seasonal wood movement. So getting the right fit can, can be tricky, but a really neat part of that is thinking about your wood in sort of a broader seasonal scope. Wood is different from metal or stone in a lot of ways. But one of the really interesting ones is, is that the way that it works. Wood is, comes from trees, which is sort of the obvious thing, right? That's not earth shattering. But what's fascinating about trees when you think about them anatomically is that at, at a pretty realistic level, what they are is a set of straws all stuck together. A tree pulls moisture from the ground. Some of the biggest ones also pull it from their leaves in and downward. But the biggest, most trees pull moisture in from the ground up to their leaves. And so there are a whole series of straws and fibers that run along their length, which has a lot of fascinating consequences. Uh, for example, it means that over time, they're gonna absorb moisture, especially in through the end of the wood. So if you have a board and you're looking at end grain and you go to wood glue onto end grain, 
you're putting glue into the end of those straws, those fibers, and it gets sucked right into the end grain because that's what they're good at. They're just about the right size so that their nature pulls the liquids up through them just, be, just like it would when it was a standing living tree. So you go to glue end grain and it's gonna suck the, the wood glue right into it. It also means that you get weird movement. Trees will change their size over the course of the year. They grow outward, that's where the tree rings come from, but you also get movement, especially in dried wood. This is, I love this diagram up here because this shows sort of the tree rings of a design and then different cuts of lumber. And you can see sort of where it's cut with the dark line. And then the, the dark colored areas are how it will change seasonally. So if you cut a round piece over here, over time, it'll squish and turn into that shape. Uh, you have a piece that's cut here. It's going to get skinnier sort of along that direction. If you're quarter sawn diagonal, you'll come out of square. A piece that's sort of long and skinny might warp in these different ways. And so there's lots of different versions to how wood is going to bend and move. This is a piece that a starting woodworker for the projects that we're going to be doing this week, this is not your primary thing to think about, but it's kind of neat to ponder when you look at a board and wonder sort of how it's going to change over time to think about how is it going to warp and bend as time passes. There's some really good, we, we know how this works really well along the grain, sort of along the fibers or tubes of it, along the, the straws in the wood, it doesn't change length almost at all. It's less than 1%, 0.01% change along that length. So it's really consistent for how long it is, but it changes a lot along the rings. So you can see all of these, if you can imagine sort of uh, radially outward from the center of the tree, that is 4% change. So it's not a lot of change that way, but once a tree is cut free from the rest of the circle, then it is able to change in size quite a bit sort of perpendicular to the radius of the tree, which is a lot. If you're not a big geometry nerd, and I certainly am, uh, that might be a lot of different geometry terms to bring into your mind, but you get a lot of wood movement in some directions and not much in the others. A fantastic woodworker will think about that when they're laying out a tabletop and they'll alternate those things so they get sort of this wavy ridged potato chip move instead of having them all facing in the same direction where you get an accumulated effect that's fighting against you on that tabletop. So planning for that, if you're building large, expensive tabletops is worth thinking about. No one should be doing that this week. Please don't try and do that. A cutting board, this is not a concern you need to be worried about. Um, but on a, on a large piece, if we're talking four feet wide by eight feet long, it starts to become a real thing that you have to worry about because 8% uh, 8% is, you know, over the, over a 10 inch span, that's, that's a pretty large amount of movement, right? You start to think about four feet, you're looking at a pretty sizable change in, in how that's going to go. So people think quite a bit about how they want to do this when they're gluing up more complicated surfaces, but that's not going to be the thing that we're going to talk about. But what are really good words for you to know is twist, cup, crook, and bow. These are four common ways that boards, that boards can bend especially when you go from rough sawn before they're surfaced and squared. You can be looking at a, a board with a cup in it. Uh, and this is the most common thing. If you're in an old house and you're looking at the hardwood floor in it, you know it was laid down without enough acclimation time if the boards are cupped. And that specifically will tell you it's probably summertime. The boards are probably wider than they were when they were originally laid. And so they'll cup because they're squished a little bit in by the, the boards on either side. There's some really interesting logic to how this works, but it's something to think about when you get to larger projects and, and bigger timescales. So how do you make a good cut? How do you do good things in the wood shop? Making a good cut is a little tricky, uh, but I would really encourage if you get a chance throughout this week to use a pull saw or a, or a push saw either way, one of the things to think about is the reflection in the saw blade. Making sure that that reflection stays a straight line can be really helpful. So this is sort of a uh, face on look at a saw from a Jonathan Katz Moses video. And if you look, this is the saw blade right here and the reflection makes it look like it's a continuous piece of wood. If your reflection works that way, you are on your way to making good cuts with a saw. But that's a, that is an art to get good at that and be able to do that reliably. That's the thing where yes, last week Paul said dovetails are like the pinnacle of woodworking. 
this is the sort of thing that a person who's trying to get good at dovetails is looking at and thinking about. So you can be imagining that for where you're going. If you want to get onto that level, it's good to start to think about cutting to fit and not to measurements. So starting to take that to heart, imagining how you can design your cuts and your pieces so that they fit together rather than follow a series of measurements with a cut list. That's a good way to move yourself forward as a woodworker if you've already got some foundational skills. If it's your first project, don't worry so much about that. Just, just cut pieces so that they look right, they fit together and that everything works. If you're trying to advance beyond that, then it starts to think about how to cut for fit rather than cut to size. Uh, and then there's a few tips on pull saws. And then I've got also for routers, things that you can look at down here if, we, if you wanted to go further. But the router is a once, it's a tricky one to wrap your head around the router table. But once you start to imagine how that machine works, it can be a really cool upgrade to your skill set in the wood shop. So we've talked a little bit about planning, prep work, cutting, and fastening is the next one. Let's see. And so how do you attach these pieces together? Most, most of you are going to breeze through the planning. The prep work is gonna be relatively nice and straightforward. Cutting, you should take your time on, go nice and slow. Don't feel rushed at any point. If you, if you wanna pause and have a moment to just reflect on a tool, that's really good to do. Uh, but then fastening is a question that everybody's gonna to need to entertain. So unless you're building a slab of wood for a, a coffee table, you're gonna to need to have some way to fasten pieces and parts together. And so there's essentially a few different ways to do this. And we're gonna, we're gonna walk our way through them. There's permanent attachments. You can do real joinery, which is, which is beautiful and wonderful. You can have removable attachments, which are really helpful for lots of different types of projects. You can think about that wood movement, uh, look at hinges and knobs, which are fun. And then there's other, there's other ways to do it also. So if we're thinking about joinery, these are the five joinery styles that I would say are really important for you to take a look at at first. We've got our classic butt joint. And so it's two pieces of wood just laid next to each other. When you're teaching joinery to teenagers, this is the one that gets all the, the snickers and the, and the, the jokes because it's, it's the butt joint, right? It's, that's, that's where your middle school self can shine. This is the funny one. Uh, but it's just two pieces put next to each other. And you've got this one surface right down here that's, that's for gluing. It's often the fastest joint to put together because you don't have to do any fancy prep work, no special cuts, a square piece next to a square piece and boom, you're done. But it's usually the weakest of these. It's not the strongest connection. It's not as much surface area where you've got things connected. And if you're not careful, you might be gluing end grain to a long grain and then the end grain is gonna just soak up the glue and you won't get as good cohesion between the two pieces. Really what you want is long grain to long grain in any of these, if you can get it to happen. But in a butt joint, if you have end grain as a part of your butt joint, it's probably gonna fall apart. So you wanna be conscious of that while you're doing it, but it's a really fast way to build things. And if you're gonna reinforce it with screws anyways, who cares, it doesn't matter. Then you can just put in the screws and it'll be okay. A miter joint, is what's often used for picture frames. It gives you this 45 degree angle down here through the side and you get a really nice look. You can often do fancy things where you maintain trim. If you have like those very de decorative picture frames with, with beading sort of looks and, and different designs cut into them, all of that can be done with a miter joint and you get a really nice continuous look to your frame. Any detail or router work on a frame can, can look really nice with a miter joint. They're also a little harder because you've got to get that 45 degree angle and it's got to be exactly 45 degrees on both sides. Anything that is, if your cut is less than 45 degrees or over 45 degrees, that diagonal won't lay perfectly. You'll have sort of a gap on either the inside or the outside. And so you want to think about that a little bit. There's some, certainly some good advice on how to do this. Most woodworkers will say, if you have to, it depends on how you're going to include a miter joint in your piece. If you can't see the inside, like if this is the inside of a cabinet, they'll say make sure the outside fits together really nicely. If you're likely going to be able to see both sides of the miter joint, usually they'll say put this one, if you're going to have to not get it perfect, get the inside not quite perfect because you can sort of burnish over the top and close the two thin parts together 
and kind of cheat your way into getting it right. But there's some subtlety to that. Um, but they look really great. Half lap joints are another fantastic strategy. Oh, yeah, you want to say something? Sure. Uh, about the miter joint, just because I worked, I used to work in a frame shop. Just a little louder. <laughs> I used to work in a frame shop. We used a lot of miter joints to obviously pick your frames. One of the ways that we cheated around those gaps that you would inevitably get is we would use different colored wax that you would press into the gaps. It does a really good job of covering up any gaps and you don't have to, you don't feel like you have to redo the joint. So there's a couple of different kinds of wax you can do, but I, at, on my own, I've been able to add color to beeswax and get it in there and it works okay, like just as a quick fix, but there's definitely wax you can buy that is specifically for fixing those mistakes. And I just wanted to say that. Yeah, that's it. That's a, those tips and tricks are the gold. Like that's the thing that takes your projects from the starter level to the next level. So it's great. Um, other joinery types, the half lap joint is a good one. It adds a lot of strength if you're gonna be putting things together because you've got a lot of long grain that's gonna be attached in a half lap joint. If you look at furniture and things around, this is a common one. It's relatively easy to do. It's not wildly complicated to add into a piece, but it gives you a lot more glue surface than a butt joint or a miter joint. And so that's really important. Miter joints will often need reinforcement because you're sort of half on end grain also. So sometimes you'll do miter joints with splines. Another one that's a good one is a box joint or a finger joint. And so here's a 3D model that I made of that. And I can pull these up. Uh, if I open up Fusion 360, but these are a series of fingers. So this is like a, a teeth on the ends of those pieces for box joints. And those teeth, if you cut them to match, you get a whole bunch of weird twisted glue surface across there. And that weirdness to the geometry where you're gluing makes it so that the pieces fit together really nice. You'll have good surfaces to register the two parts together, but it also gives you lots of good glue surface. And because there's variety in how they're attached, you'll get extra strength from, from that added uh, connection points. And so that's a really good way to make something extra strong if you're trying to put together panels for something like that. And then a classic is the rabbit joint. This is really helpful for like putting on the backs of boxes or putting on the, like if you're building a cabinet or something and you wanna have a back to it, you put a rabbit joint around it and then the back panel can be dropped into there. This, and it may not seem like that's a lot of strength, but by giving two different surfaces that you're gluing to, it can be really helpful. It also can be good just to make sure that you have a good solid fit. And by having it have something to register against, your back panel will not have visible gaps around the edge. If you just tried to like put it in there or put it on the back, you'd see more exposed edges and the, there's a chance that light might come through. So rabbit joints can be really helpful, a good way to make those things work. Um, and if you're looking at the sand table that we built last year, we actually used sort of a rabbit joint to inlay the glass tabletop, which is a good way to make something like that happen also. But the, all those five categories of joinery, if you were to take those five categories and you, and you thought that each one of them was maybe just a little bit too simple, you can certainly upgrade any one of them by adding some of these features. You can add in splines, which are these things over here where you make a cut and then fill it in with another piece of wood. You can add in dowels, sort of like is shown here. You drill holes and then put dowels in to add some strength. You can do dominoes, which we don't have a domino tool here at Maycaven, but it's something that we could maybe try and, and suggest that we get. They're kind of expensive though. But we do have a biscuit joiner where you can add in these. These are little biscuits. There's a fun tool. It's got a video and a checkout but it's really handy to use. It's, it's a pretty safe one because the cutting piece is almost always embedded into the wood. It's never really free if you're using it right. And the, these little biscuits can really help with alignment. Last year, Lila made a, a entry shoe station, uh, a piece of furniture, and she used the biscuit joiner to make sure that all of the pieces lined up really nicely. Instead of having to try and hold them in place while you're gluing and fastening, the biscuits can deal with alignment for you. And then the, there's also angles that you can add into things just for some flair and detail. And then bow ties are a fun one to add in bow ties to a piece of woodworking. And so bow ties in your woodworking are a fun look. I can't believe I don't have any pictures of them. 
Uh, let's pull up woodworking bow ties. Let's see what we got. This is this is definitely a classic. Let's see, are we getting it? Bow ties, woodworking. Uh, uh, Vincent just mentioned in the chat oh. that Domino joiners are only a thousand dollars. Yeah, Domino joiners are pretty are pretty expensive. These, yeah, they're pretty they're pretty not cheap. Uh, but these bow ties, so not like bow ties like you'd wear. These are these are just sort of kitschy things. But a bow tie like this can be really helpful to add strength to a piece. And usually they're not put along something like that. They're added into a piece where you might have a split and a piece of wood like that. So if you have a piece of wood that's got a crack in it, a bow tie can be a way to add. It's a little joinery detail. Some people love them. Some people think that they're ugly. I, I particularly like them. But that wedge shape on both sides, if you, if you cut a hole and then put one of these in, they can hold a crack together forever. You know, if you have a big, if you spent a lot of money on a big slab of wood and it's got a crack in it, you add a bow tie so that over time those cracks don't open up and your piece doesn't go bad after a, a period of years. So you can definitely think about that when how you're, with how you're building things. It's a classy way to make any piece look a lot more professional is by adding in a bow tie is my thought. And not just because, you know, it's a bow tie, but because it's a, a really good trick for woodworking to make a a slab of wood. Oh, here's a good one. To take this crack right here and you add bow ties along its along that crack, you're going to keep the crack from opening over time. That's really what they're best at. But you know, the, the internet has turned them into all sorts of other things also. So we've got all sorts of these joinery types to play with. Bow ties can be intimidating. They're going to take you for one bow tie, even if you're pretty good at it, it might take you an hour. They're a slow adventure, but they can really make for a high quality look. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good question. So the sand table, if you go take a look at it when we're done, we use splines. So they were edge joints, edge joints that we were gluing together just as sort of butt joints, which is often not the best for alignment or strength. So we use the table saw to cut strips down the middle, and then we would add in thin splines between each piece to hold them together. You'll notice we weren't, we're not the best woodworkers. That was a learning project. It wasn't like a masterpiece. Don't get me wrong. So there's some cracks between those pieces, but the splines can do a really good job of holding that together. And if you dial in your cuts and your angles and all that really well, the splines will add a lot of added strength because they can add strength even when you have bad joints, like, like we do on a few spots. Don't, don't judge us too harshly. But uh, they, can, they can really add a lot of strength to a piece and a lot of alignment to a piece. And it's, it's as easy as just cutting a strip of wood that's about the same size as your table saw blade and then cutting a slot with the table saw blade and then using that to put them together. It's relatively quick and easy, and it's a nice trick. But there's other ways to glue things or to put things together. If, if you wanted to do connecting, you can do it with permanent connections or with temporary connections, removable connections. For all of the permanent connections, wood glue and the joinery styles that we've been talking about, that's it, that's all you need. You don't have to do anything else if you've got a properly wood glued together piece of joinery. And for the best joinery, you don't even need wood glue. So for more elaborate connections, definitely woodworking was happening before good wood glue was invented. So you can get joints that work without wood glue at all. But you can also glue in dowels just to make your life easier. You can use nails, which I would say are mostly permanent. Screws I'd put in the temporary category, but this is a good trick for like a, a Craig jig where you can sink in a screw. You can see that here. And then here's a dowel laid in behind it. So it's sort of a screw hidden in the piece. You'd never be able to get out. But it's permanently locked in there, but you also hide that it's there. So you get the strength of the screw, but you can completely hide that it's, that it's present. And all of these are permanent methods of joining, which is completely, completely a good way to go. But over here on this side, you've got these removable things. And so an exposed screw can be really helpful. You might have this weird type of joinery, which is a neat trick where you've got a nut and a, and a screw that fit together, where you drill a hole in this way and a hole through that way. 
and this like cylindrical thing fits in. This is a lot like Ikea furniture gets put together this way. Um, the, there's different types of joiner. You can actually bulk order these. I used to be carrying around a bag full of those things. They're, they're a neat way to put some extendability to your pieces to make them things that you can put together and take apart. Uh, and depending on what you're building, that could be really valuable. So for a cutting board, it's not what you want. You're gonna gl wood glue. But if you're building something where you might need to get inside of a cabinet or where you may need to disassemble, having temporary fasteners can be really helpful. Another thing that make, that's good for removability are these figure of eight fasteners. These are often used. You can see this side's beveled and this, this side is not. These are used commonly to hold tabletops to table aprons because the tabletop is that big slab of wood that might expand and contract. You use something like this where you've got a couple attachment points that aren't that can move a little bit relative to each other so that when the tabletop expands and contracts, you can have fasteners that actually allow for that movement a little bit. So if you're building a table, you'd use something like this to make sure that it has the ability to flex even though it's held together really strong. And that's like a, a next level skill, but these figure of eight fasteners for wood movement can be really cool. You can also like put in screws in oversized holes. There's a few ways to solve that problem. But it's interesting to think about how you deal with this wood movement game over the, the long scale when you're thinking about tabletops that might expand in ways that you don't want them to. So how do you fasten a tabletop to a table apron is a really good puzzle. Um, and then other ways that you can do it is some, some things are built in ways that they just sort of click together and you can take them apart, put them together. So there's some neat tricks there. The one last and totally worth talking about method uh, for how to build things is with a mixed media of epoxy and wood. People absolutely love epoxy and wood. Some people think it's a fad. Some people think it's not. Some, it's, it's really a neat material. Um, and what's really cool about epoxy, I think, if I were to try and explain it in the current context, is that it's a plastic material that you pour in as a liquid and it solidifies. But what's really cool is that it's, a very good adhesive and it's got just about the same machinability as the wood itself. So once you have it, once it's set, if it all sets up just right, you can run it through the table saw, you can use a sander on it, you can do all sorts of different things because the machinability of the, of the wood and the epoxy are very, very similar. This is, uh, there's lots of different tables that show up like this. This is a, a river table or sort of a marsh table as I think what it was called on Wayfair. And this, when I looked it up last year, was a, it's a $9,000, $10,000 table because that's a lot of epoxy and that's a really fancy piece of wood and then custom legs to go with it. I mean, this is, you could totally build this here and then have a high-end woodworking job just building tables like these and selling them to high-end client, clients who are willing to pay. It's totally a thing that you could get started with in here. Um, most people, I think that's a lofty goal. Don't get started with that. That's not, don't, that's not project one, but you know, a little epoxy coffee table can be fun. Um, epoxy is delightfully straightforward to work with. You feel like a chemist while mixing it up. And then once it's, once it's up and running, uh, you can you can tell it's a high-end woodworking experience. Also, brass and aluminum are metals that a metal worker might not even qualify as metals. Brass and aluminum are so easy to work that you can often work them with standard woodworking tools. Not our, not the, um, don't use them on the table saw because the table saw will take anything that's electrically conductive and fire off the safety bolt. So you can't use them on our table saw unless you disable that the right setting the right way, um, which does automatically turn on the next time it's powered up. But you can work some metals into woodworking projects also to get some really interesting effects from metal and wood and epoxy all put together. So there's a lot of cool potential there for fascinating projects. And so once you've, once you've thought about all the different ways that you might fasten things together, then it's time to start thinking about finishing your piece. And so finishing is all about sanding, planes and card scrapers, uh, wood stains, finishes, and some paint, which maybe I think the, the, you know, the wood, wood shop facilitators would yell at me for talking about stains or paint that much with woodworking, but they're totally valid ways to finish a project. First off, for sanding. Sanding is fascinating. Sand as a material is silicon dioxide, 
and it's exceptionally hard. Sand is much harder than wood. And so you can take a, a piece of sand and scrape it on wood and it will cut right through the fibers. It'll cut through those little straws. And so sandpaper does a great job of cutting the, the fibers of the wood and it removes very small amounts. There's a grit system for sandpaper where the lower the number, the bigger the sand. And so you get rougher, coarser cuts. It, it removes more material faster. And then you move up in number for your sanding grits and the, the pieces get smaller and smaller and smaller. Usually you do that sequentially going from biggest, coarsest to finest sand to get smoother and smoother surfaces. And sometimes you'll spray the wood piece with water in between to help the, the grain raise a little bit. And then your sanding for the next round goes a little bit better. So there's some tricks to that, but sanding is how you go from the, the sort of sharp edges and hard sides of a wood piece to, to what feels like a soft piece. All the woodworking pieces that you've bought in your life from like a, you know, a, a furniture store, they've all been sanded so they feel soft on the edges. There's no sharp edges to those things. They just wanna sand them over. But it's a really good trick. Uh, it's useful. You can do this all by hand or there's plenty of power sanders that are really great. You should explore if you're gonna be sanding for any length of time. But sandpaper is, is really useful. There's also little discs you can buy for about a dollar in the back. So if you wanna get yourself a collection, I actually bought like five or six, keep them in my bag. Whenever I use them, I pull them out. When I'm done with them, I put them back in my bag. And when they're spent, I toss them and get a new one. So just having a few can be really helpful. It's nice to just be able to grab some and use them. There's also some sandpaper up here and there's a cabinet of free sandpaper in the back also, if you're looking for that. I really like the orbital sanders. And so for me, it's worth it to just spend the dollar and, and make it easy. Another thing, sanding is good. It makes a lot of dust. What's up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The last is terrible. Uh, sanding end grain is terrible. Sorry, I lost that word somehow. But if you're sanding a long, a long grain or edge grain, it's not too bad. Sanding end grain to try and get it smooth is slow and the worst. So if you can have a machine do that for you, awesome. If you can avoid doing it all together, even better. Um, sanding end grain is long and slow and try to not do it ever if you can avoid it. But you will at some point. And it's not, it's not too bad, it's just the worst. Um, planes and scrapers. Sanding makes tons and tons of dust. And sometimes a nice way to get a good finish is to finish off with a planer where you're not taking off little tiny bits of fibers, you're taking off whole fibers together. And so you can get very smooth surfaces with a planer or a scraper where you're removing sort of ribbons of material. If you haven't ever watched, well, you've probably been able to find somewhere on the internet oddly satisfying planer videos. And if you haven't seen any of those, I'm gonna put those in foundations oddly satisfying planar videos, it's magical. You can get ribbons of wood. Um, Pask Makes was a video, as was a channel I put up on the Slack uh, channel this week. He makes entire lamp shades out of just plain, uh, plain shavings from a planer where you can glue them onto a piece of, of thin plastic and make a, a lamp shade out of wood shavings from these. There's all sorts of cool things that you can do with them, but they really give you a different vibe from sanding because they pull off entire fibers at a time. So you get a, a much cleaner looking finish and some people really prefer it, but often it's much slower. So it's a trade-off, depends on your perspective. Uh, definitely some people really love planes. And I know that there's, I know that Vincent was, was trying to restore some planes. Planes are also something that can last intergenerationally. I have a planer that my, was my grandfather's, maybe even his father's. They, they can last for a long time. And so they're really sort of cool in that way also. But then we've got the whole category of how do you do, what's your final coatings? And so when we're thinking about these, there's finishes, stains, and then paints and top coverings are sort of the three buckets I would put finishing in for wood projects. Finishes are what's gonna soak into the wood. If we're gonna share oddly satisfying woodworking videos, the finishing of a wood piece is a magical moment. When you put an oil or a wax over a piece of wood and all of a sudden the grain just turns this magical rich color, you're gonna really enjoy that moment of your project where it goes from just being a rough piece of wood that looks you know, like something that's been in a garage for too long to all of a sudden something that's shiny and beautiful. That's a really magical moment and you can do a nice job with lots of different finishes. 
There are some that are food safe. There's some that are not. Uh, if you have something that's like a beeswax, that's going to be really good. We do have several finishes here. Mineral oil is another good option that is food safe. It's a thing that you can that you can use. But uh, lots of those things can be really helpful. Finishes, when you add them to a piece, can take about a week to stabilize and dry. And that's totally fine. It might have a smell for a little while and then, and then get better over time. But that's something that you want to take a look at. There's lots of good recommendations. And if you have a chance to talk about your particular project, we can come up with a good finish for you to think about. Stains are another one that I think is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, at the house that I had back in Ohio, I actually had a, a wood parquet floor that I did a gray stain on and I really enjoyed. The wood had a nice gray color to it after that. Some woodworkers will say, absolutely not, never ever shall you ever do a wood stain. They just love the natural wood look and that's it. Uh, but there's plenty of strong opinions about that. And I think it boils down to what are your color preferences? And so what colors do you want? What color do you like? How, how much are you willing to do for that? Stains can sometimes behave strangely on different woods. They often work very different on something like an oak with very large, deep uh, voids and fibers versus like a maple where the, the grain is a lot tighter. So they'll look different on different woods. And so that's something to think about. And then paint and top covers are, are totally valid. If you've got a project and you want to paint over its top, you can totally do that. It's also a good way to hide blemishes. Um, if you buy the cheapest tier cabinets from Home Depot or Lowe's, they'll even come with a wrap over their surface so that you don't even know what the wood looks like underneath. And that is specifically so that they can use the cheapest possible wood they can get, right? And then they wrap it in a plastic so that it looks good but it's, you're not even really looking at the wood. Uh, so you can think about how you wanna have your wood piece end up. And usually if you the finish is gonna be hiding the least, a stain will help you cover up a little bit of detail. And if you paint or add any other covering to it, you're gonna really be able to hide any blemishes or, or problems really effectively. But some people, you know, different people have different preferences for where you land on that spectrum. Also, while we're talking about wood projects, it's really important that we discuss plywood and all of its many different forms because it is an oddly technical material. So just here's, there's no way we're gonna cover all of plywood. These are all of the different words that you might see in a very, or many of the words you might see. Baltic birch is something that we're gonna see in here quite a bit. There are sheets available for sale in the back and fingers crossed we'll get some more soon. Uh, but Baltic birch has lots of very thin layers that are put together really tightly. It's very high quality wood. The finish is very good. This is what people really like to make furniture out of. Uh, it's got a fantastic look. It finishes really nicely. It's a fan favorite here for sure. Sandy ply is cheap-ish from Home Depot. It's what's used, sometimes this is called cabinet grade wood, where you've got a very thin layer on top, a very thin layer on bottom and then you've got beefier, thicker layers through the plywood. This is not a, nearly as expensive as Baltic birch. And I would advise to use this sparingly. Think about where you wanna use it, how you wanna use it. And if you can avoid using sandy plywood, the thing about it is that it's got veneers that are exceptionally thin. We're talking paper thin. And so if you drill through them, they start to splinter. You make cuts that are slightly off angle, large pieces can come off. It can be really good in some scenarios, but it also can be, and making cabinets is a great example of where it shines, but it also can be, because it's cheap, it's appealing, but used in the wrong context, it can give you a very subpar product. Cabinet grade walnut is essentially sandy ply with a walnut veneer. It's the same thing, but slightly, slightly nicer looking on the outside. We have some pieces in the back if you wanted to look at that. Um, and it costs a little bit more because of the higher quality veneer. Sheathing is something that I really like to use whenever I can. It's really good for jigs or hidden construction. It's dirt cheap. It's exceptionally strong. It's what a subfloor is made on in your house. So you're walking on sheathing all the time. Uh, it's what, if you have a hardwood floor, it's probably built on top of this stuff. And so this is really an important piece to frame out houses, to put all over the place. And it's, like $35 for a four foot by eight foot sheet, even in our current crazy lumber market. 
So sheathing can be really helpful, but it's not, it's not good to look at. You don't wanna have that be something that you're looking at in your project, but if you can get some structure or build a jig out of it, it's a good way to go. Verniers on plywood have all sorts of ratings, A, B, C, and D, that's for how they look. An A grade veneer has no blemishes in it whatsoever. A B will have very minimal and they'll be patched. C is gonna have more blemishes and D you'll see holes and voids and things on the surface. And then internal voids would be great if you could avoid them completely. Then there's these other things, whoops. MDF is sort of like a pressed cardboard. It's medium density fiberboard. It's essentially cardboard, but uh, much thicker. And so that cardboard material is really pretty cheap. It's very easy to machine. It's, it gives off tons of dust. It's the surface of the Gerber and the Shapoko, the like the underboard, those are MDF. And if you cut through them, it gets really, really dusty, really fast. It's really good for projects, except if you're gonna have it in any sort of a wet environment, if MDF gets wet, sort of like if a sheet of paper gets wet, it's ruined forever. So MDF paneling for in a bathroom sounds like a great idea until you have it in the bathroom and any water gets on it, you've got a problem. Painting it to seal it can sometimes solve that problem. But at this point in my life, I, if I can avoid it uh, for a bathroom, I will. Ikea tables often use a lot of this because it's cheap uh, and it can be made from totally recycled materials. So it's, it's really great in a lot of ways, but I think if you're strategic about where you use it is the best thing to do. It's also, M Ikea uses a lot of MDF along with hardboard to balance those two. Hardboard is harder and it does, it's not nearly as susceptible to water. And so they'll usually use an MDF core with some cardboard and then a hardboard on top of it to get a perfect balance of strength and water resistance and a few other properties. Um, and so that's a really cool way to go. OBS is like, if you've ever seen a big panel it looked like it was made out of wood chips, that was OBS. OBS is the cheapest because it's the things they can sweep up off the floor. And so it works really well. It's probably in the same ballpark as price for sheathing, uh, but it's just got a terrible look. And so many people don't wanna do it. It also doesn't take screws or some of the other fixing methods as well because of that nature. It's usually completely fine for construction, but it's just got its own quirks, but it's a lot cheaper. And then melamine is an interesting one. This is OBS with a plastic coating on top. There's a lot of shelves in closets that will be melamine because it can be wiped clean really easily. Uh, and they'll sell it in the big box stores for shelves where you can buy it at the perfect depth for a shelf. You can also usually buy four foot by eight foot sheaths and like Home Depot or Lowe's would cut most panels of plywood for you, but they won't cut this stuff because the plastic on it is bad for their saw and they know it. They want you to cut it on your own saw. Don't have them do it. It's an interesting material. It's really fascinating. It's super helpful. It's completely water resistant on the surface, but it's also got some quirks to it. Uh, so it's, it's good in some ways. If you're gonna use, if you're gonna do any concrete casting, it's super helpful for that because concrete won't stick to it. And epoxy does a pretty good job of not sticking to melamine. It's very wipeable clean, but it's got quirkiness to it. So it's, it's good to think about where strategically you'd wanna use it, but you can't lump it in with all the rest of the plywoods. So there's some, some delicate balance. Plywood is oddly technical. You wouldn't think that it's as tricky as like buying a new laptop, but it can kind of land in that realm of like weird, what properties do I need? What do I want? How do we make it work? Uh, and so thinking about your, your plywood can be something that takes a little bit of effort. And, and certainly like the big box store, like Lowe's and Home Depot or any of those places that sell sheets of plywood, they expect that someone in coming in to buy a sheet knows what they're looking for. So there's not necessarily, unless you get there with the right employee at the place, you're not necessarily gonna get a lot of help on choosing the right panel for you. So having a little bit of legwork done ahead of time or asking either of us or any of, any of us who've been in the wood shop a little bit longer can be really helpful for making sure you're getting the right stuff. I mean, you could always buy Baltic birch, but that's gonna get really expensive really fast. So thinking about what to use and where can be helpful. So what are the next things to do? Cause we're, we're already just a little bit over for time. The big things for this week is I would love it for you to decide on a project, get the wood for what you wanna make, finalize plans, and then make the thing. 
That's the goal. And Annie is already like three quarters of the way there. So way to go. Uh, another thing that we wanna do before we, before we leave, and especially for everybody here, there's a foundation shelf in the back of Make Haven. So if you've been to the back storage area, there's a special spot for us where we're gonna be able to store projects that we're working on. Cause you're in this class, you have access. It is a shared storage. Uh, in addition to the 48 hour table, the 48 hour table is the place where you wanna leave anything that's like actively gluing uh, or for 48 hours, it can live there without a problem. You put your name on it. There's stickers you put on things. There's even when the printer's up and running, there's a printer, you swipe your badge and there's a pre-printed sticker you put on things. And that works great. For us, while you're in the class, you'll have access to the foundation shelf, or if you have things for a few more days, or like, you, you know, you put it in to glue up on Monday, and then you talk, chat with somebody and say, I can't be in until Friday. Hey, James, could you pull it out of clamps and put it on the foundation shelf? We can sort of help each other throughout this process in making sure that we make that happen. And we can use the foundation shelf as sort of an intermediary for where to store, share, uh, and, and get things. And so that can be really helpful. We're gonna point that out for people. The next time you're in the space, we're gonna talk about that particular spot. Um, I wanna do show and tell. We're gonna do that soon, but I made a little list of things that I should make sure to not talk about. Uh, make sure to not forget about. So one of the things that is important is getting to know each other. And so remember we talked about, we're gonna do a pizza party. We're gonna really do that. Uh, we're gonna do it on Sunday. It'll be at 4 p.m. Pizza, maybe ice cream. It'll be here. So that's right in the woodworking time. So if you wanna come in, chat about your project, finish it up, grab a slice, uh, talk a little, all of that we wanna be able to do and really have some nice time with some camaraderie. And so that is on Sunday. And I know that people are busy. There's no pressure to be here for that. We just wanna make sure that it's, that it's available. And that if you're interested in, and, and wanna be here, that you feel totally welcome and invited. So please feel free to come in for that. Uh, we look forward to getting a chance to just get to know each other a little bit more. It's fun to make sure that you, you know, to see everybody chat about what you're up to. By that point, most projects will be pretty far along or you'll be heavily in the drama of getting it there. And then that's a fun time to be together, to chat about what you're up to or, or see what's happened. So we look forward to that. That's gonna be Sunday at four. We have some tentative plans that we're ironing out and, and it's gonna be exciting. Um, yeah, let's see. And then that is, that's pretty much it. Any other things that we need to say at the start? Or it's show and tell time, I think. Okay, so as we do show and tell, one of the interesting things about this week, it should be relatively rapid fire. Um, as we're gonna talk about class things this week, let's talk about the badging process, sort of what it was, how did, it, what was it what you expected? Was it not, what were good, what was good, what was bad, or whatever you have for thoughts about it. And any cool things, any cool observations or cool things that you've worked on between now and then. So uh, we're gonna do show and tell and we'll, we'll see how that goes. We can start with people who are, at, everybody at home has their cameras on. So how about we start, we start there with the people who are on Zoom. I'm gonna mute microphones here and let's see, Norm, you're in the top corner. For me, would you, would you mind going first? You just unmute your microphone. Should be in the bottom left corner. There you How go. How about that? Is that working? Yeah. Can I share a screen? Sure. Yeah. And let me see if yeah. I can bring up what I've been working on. Should uh, be the green button at the bottom. Is that showing? Is it? If it's not showing, I, I'll, I'll just. Uh, I'll just talk about it. Uh, Let's see. Oh, maybe I need to I'll try try one more time, Norm. There's a button that I need to click. Uh, it's worth just taking time to see if I can do this. Is that showing at all? Nope. Okay. Maybe we. I'll, I'll tell yeah. you what it what you would see if if it had worked. Um, what you would see is I, I, I cut down uh, part of a tree um, in um, 
uh, in my uh, yard and uh, it was covered with bark, of course. And I um, brought it into the wood lathe uh, and um, uh, cleaned it up. And um, my hope is that eventually I'll make it into a, a, a cup or a bowl of some sort. Uh, and I also um, had done a, 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 um, a, uh, a cutting board, uh, which uh, I did at Make Haven, but I did it before this. And it's great and, and very practical. And I would show you a picture, but uh, I can't seem to. So um, just know that it's a good thing. Cool, I think it just turned on. Oh, good. Okay, well, there's, so that's what, yeah, that's what I was able to make by way of a cutting board. Uh, cut down the little branch, figured out different ways of cleaning it up. And now I'm in the process of figuring out how to make a, you know, a bowl shape. I'd probably cut it halfway down to make it more like a bowl. I'd probably clean it up a lot, but that's what I've been up to. That's really cool. And, you know, bonus, there's your, there's your website. Oh, yes. And I also made the logo visible by changing the website and put in pictures of Italy where I was hiking when all you guys were working starting up the course. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. Wait, Wait a, I'll show wait, you I'll one, rub I, it in. <laughs> let me just show you one more thing, which is uh, this is a box I made, which uh, is, you know, the butt joint kind of thing. And yeah. it's, uh, the, 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 the lid is really cool. It's just a piece of scrap lovely wood that I resawed that down by hand and, and glued together. Um, and there's nothing to this really, but it looks really good, I think. Yeah, it totally does. Awesome. All right, cool. Let's I don't know how see. to stop the, the sharing. Oh, it should, it should be, you are good. Go to the zoom at the bottom there, down on the bottom of your screen. Uh, blue logo. I must. I must be on full. Somehow I'm not. Oh yeah. That that one right there. Click on that thing, and then it should be at the top. There should be a stop share button that's kind of red, a bar towards the bottom of that thing that pops uh, up. You have hijacked this meeting. Sorry, I. I uh, I'm not seeing that control. If I can. You can you shut off screen sharing? I I might be able to. Uh, da, 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 da. Stop participant sharing. There we go. Okay, we're good. We got it back. All right, uh, Alina, you're the next in my Zoom order. Would you like to share what you've been up to? Sure. Uh, I have been a lot up to having my family in town and a lot of not make haven. <laughs> um, it's all right. Yeah. So I'm very behind on my badges, but excited to get in there next week and. Hurry up. I think I have already decided on my project and I'm going to make a charcuterie board for my parents who were in town. So took that's, them into my cabin to see the spot. So it's exciting. Cool. That's lots of fun. I'm a, I'm a big believer of family first. And so a family's in town or needs you or whatever, a hundred percent, you should, you should be helping family or being with family. So no, no worries or hard feelings there. All right, let's, and I, they're gonna love the cutting, the charcuterie board too, by the way. That'll, that'll go over really well. Uh, Vincent, you're next up. Do you wanna tell us what you're up to? Sure, um, so am I going to go over the stuff that I badged on or just stuff that I've been doing in general? Cause there's some stuff I've been working on on the side that's not like in the wood shop, but it's done at Make Haven. You're, can you be just a little bit closer to your microphone? How about now? Can you hear me now? Just a little, yeah. Let, let's um, see if Renee could chat and then try, Vincent, do the audio test to make sure that your sound is up. Because I can hear you. It's just quiet. How about now? Oh, hey, yeah, that's great. OK, great. So um, yeah, I was pretty much just yeah, asking. For what I'm going to be talking about, would it be what I did that's related to badging, or is it what I've done in general? Oh, well, I, it's cool if it's about badging, but also it's fun to have a little variety in show and tell. So whatever you've been up to. Cool. 
So I've been pretty much just trying to get badge on as many different things as possible. Um, the wood lathe was one of them. I'm probably going to want to, to go through that again, just so I can feel a little more confident with that. Um, I've also been doing a lot of 3D printing lately, um, working in the metal shop as well, trying to learn how to tap threads into, into different parts so I could put screws in them. And that would be so that way I'd be able to make certain jigs and stuff that I'd use in the wood shop, like a, like a push block and stuff like that. If I share awesome. my screen, I can show you the website. Yep, let me make sure that my end is, yeah, you got it, okay, cool. Can you see that? Yeah. Cool. Um, so I got some pictures on here. I didn't take as many, or I didn't put in as many pictures that I had hoped for because most of the pictures that I had taken were not related to badging. But I pretty much just go over why I got into woodworking, some of the things I got badged on, um, why I, I got badged, where I badged on certain things and not other ones. And yeah, this is a good reason why I wanted to start with the jointer because I haven't used one before. Yeah. Um, so these two came from Make Havens. Um, yeah, this one I yep. took myself. Um, one of the things I am working on is plane restoration. And I figured I would take the smallest, cheapest, um, rustiest plane I had to, to work on. So that way, if something went wrong, then it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that, de-rusting and stuff like that. And yeah, this is what I thought was going to happen after I started using the wood lathe. Yeah. At least during the checkout. It is, it's a little scary, I will say, but like, you know, once you get going, it's not, it's not the worst thing. It's kind of a fun dance. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so lots of fun uh, stuff. That's awesome. And uh, kudos on the documenting. Documenting is one that's tricky and I was not even particularly thinking about documenting during the badging process, but you nailed it. And over the next week, when you're building your own project, it'll be good to reflect and take a minute and take some pictures as you're going, just to remember the process and to get those in, in progress shots, as well as things at the end. So it'll be good to think about your, this is a great reminder to, to think about all that as we're going. So awesome, great work, Vincent. Uh, Renee, you wanna tell us what you've been up to this week? Yeah, so, um... I got badged on a lot more than I thought I was going to because I came in for one of the foundation days and a lot of people were getting badged on a lot of things. And so that was pretty exciting. I feel like I learned how a lot of stuff worked. Um, one of the things was the lathe, which is what I'm the most excited about. Um, I haven't like actually started my project yet, but um, getting badged on that was a pretty cool experience. Um, the face shield didn't quite fit my face, so that might be a slight problem, but uh, I'll figure it out. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, I'm oh, sorry. No, you're good. Oh, Keep going. Yeah. Um, it was just, yeah, it was um, it was a cool process. I'll admit I was like a little bit intimidated at first, I think, by everything, but I think that the process was really like reassuring and like I felt like my hand was kind of held through the whole way so like you know I wasn't in any danger I didn't have anything to be afraid of um and I just by the end of it I felt really confident um which you know is the goal so really stoked yeah. about that um and I have so much inspiration for the projects I want to do I'm kind of thinking about making a bowl now on the lathe but I definitely want to use the lathe and another thing that I had sketched out is um, these cute little mushrooms. Um, so some of these are candle holders. So ignore these, cause this is like a little intense. I just, my brain was kind of going and I thought it was fun, but I thought making little wooden mushrooms could be cute. Um, and I saw a lot of examples that I liked. So um, that might be something that I do instead of a bowl. I don't know, I, it's probably easier than a bowl. We'll see, we'll see how it goes and what happens. Yeah. It could be fun. A lot of the, you sent me a few images and they were really delicate. If you're, yeah. if you're trying to make like a little bit bigger mushrooms at the start and then sort of work your way towards mm -hmm. delicate ones, 
I think that, that, that that'll go well. The delicate ones, I think, really are, are probably like a high level of skill. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. And so starting with bigger ones will, will be a, a nice way to get some early wins. Okay, yeah, that's good advice. Yeah. Oh, and you brought up a point. Ileana had a really good thought about a lot of our different weird tools. They're sometimes sized for someone who's more like my size and which is, you know, six feet tall and big long arm span, which is not how everyone is sized in the class or in general. And so we're thinking across the board on how do we get like Apple boxes to stand on or different things, in different scenarios for, for certain tools. And maybe we need to think about getting a second face shield, right? One that's my size and one that's your size so that we have one for everybody. Those are all totally things that we can, that we can, that come up and we think about and we can improve the whole space. So, awesome, thanks, uh, good week. And then let's do the, we're gonna now switch over to the people who are in the room and we can do the pass around mic. Is that mic turned on? Yeah, I think we're, we're on and we're good, cool. So we can just pass this around. Go for it, we'll just do the pass. Okay, um, so, so far I came on Thursday and on, Sunday to get myself badged in the tools that I thought I would need to make my project based on what I'm thinking I'm going to make. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Sure. Yep, good. So I did uh, I did a my first sort of sketch, construction sketch of trying to think it through. And um, it didn't dawn on me to put it on the website. So I the only way I could do it is to email it to you and you put it up there. Ah, don't worry about it. I could actually, I could put it up here right. onto the camera. Good luck. You want it? Yeah, here, it's here only in pencil, so. We're gonna do, we're gonna do this. All right. So you just chat about it and we can, we can look at what you drew. So what it would be is a footrest for me when I'm sitting at my desk because my chair doesn't go low enough that my feet are not, you know, comfortable. I want my feet up you know, up a little bit off the ground. So my idea, it was almost like starting with a very simple uh, cutting board, you know, where it's like two panels and then maybe a strip of a different wood in the center, so a darker wood. And um, what you're looking at on the upper left is the looking down at it, just the top. But then if you move over to the right, so it's actually at an angle and it's not even all that tall. It's um, a total of two inches on the lower portion and three, I think I three yep. on the upper. Yeah. Um, so I showed the top, the side and the back. I didn't bother to show the front just to kind of show you that I'm creating some sort of a brace to um, make the legs more stable and Ideally, what I'd really love is two different colored woods so that that brown stripe in the center is also the side pieces that poke up through the top and, and be it that they're square profiles or round dowel profile. I don't know, sure. it's just one thought. Yeah. If I, I'm not going crazy. This is a fantastic example of planning out and having a sketch for a model can be, can be really invaluable to take just like a, you know, a little bit of time and do, and do some of this can really take an idea from sort of a vague thought in your head into something that's much more tangible, much more actionable. So some, this is a great start to getting, to getting towards a project for this week. And it can really be a, a good way to rocket you into where you're going. And so then I put different questions on there so I can discuss with who can help me think it through. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. And that's it. Yeah, way to, way to go. All right, next up. Um, I'm thinking about making a impossible triangle. Um, so this is a geometric geometric object, which is basically a 3D version of Mobius belt. Um, when you're making it, you, I think you can make three sticks, which is the three sides of the triangle and link them together. And I think we're going to do it by, by dovetails, um, but it's going to be hard because the three sides are not linked uh, in the regular way, and you need to measure the angles quite carefully. Um, I don't know. 
Um, I might just make one part of it this week. I don't think it's possible to make the whole triangle um, uh, this week, I guess. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. It's it's neat to have interesting geometries. I love that in any project. But what's good to do is to think about it in that design cycle sort of way. So how could you what could what could be a first test? Like, how do you get the first part of the geometry to work? Maybe you do the sort of simple triangle and then you start to think about, well, how would you want the joinery to fit? And then you can sort of test out the joinery piece separate from the whole triangle okay. and start to think about different pieces of it separately so that you can then worry about integration as a separate part of the project's development instead of trying to do all of it in one go at the beginning. So like a simple mock-up and then the joinery and then start to think about putting those together can be a lot more approachable than trying to do all one, one big fancy move at one shot. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, but great, great idea, it's exciting. Um, so I have this thing right here. <laughs> I'm going to fix it, hopefully. Um, uh, an instrument case and got damaged in the in the bed. So I'm uh, going to try to fix it. Um, might need a little more experience before I can get to it. Um, but this is something I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, and I'm also thinking uh, to make a stand for the instrument um, should be pretty easy. Uh, I mean, it looks pretty easy. <laughs> uh, it's definitely like, it's going to take a lot of like measurements and all that. So uh, what I'm thinking is like basically two pieces of, of wood, um, kind of like a, an X and then um, having like a, a groove where the the, um, the instrument can, can can stay on it on top of it, um, yeah. So just that. Yeah. Uh, and I do have a lot of other things that I <laughs> I hope to make. I would like to make some wands <laughs> uh, and uh, um, a cat tree. Um, sure. And um, I've always been wanting to have a. Um, ceremony little station yeah so yeah those are what i'm thinking right now that's a that's a ton of really cool ideas i love each one of them my advice is pick one early and stick stick to it so that you're so that you're good to go the week happens fast so so just pick one that you think is achievable inside the week and go for it all right annie do you think you can tilt that whole thing up and show us yes, yes. excellent Okay, I, I got confused. I thought that this is something that has to be ready today. Oh, no, um, you, you did great. It's, it's not. So I just, I was just a little bit in a rush. I did this. I was trying to focus on the, on the budgets that I needed for this project. And I wanted to do something like a small, something that I feel comfortable with. Um, obviously, I did this backwards because I didn't any you know draw anything now i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it better sure finishing painting it and trying to do something cute small and functional you know to put the, the mask you know what it's gonna be cute plant for the kids right here you know sunglasses uh, you know that's Annie, it's incredible. I'm, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm really impressed. But uh, I didn't know <laughs> even how to use a drill, so I was waiting for for Corey to uh, because it was just so difficult. I yeah, I mean, I mean, you just like you went after it, even though there were brand new skills. Yeah. Like the, the grit that it takes to do that is immense. Okay, uh, so yeah. kudos to you Thank for you. that. It's a yeah. fantastic project. <laughs> I know there's things that you would want to change and make and make different. But like what you've got, many people would be very, very proud of and be like ready to be done and put it on the wall. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so if you like, please continue with it as much as you want. But it's a great, I think, a good model for people to see sort of what is a good scale and scope for a project over the next week to go for. Okay. You're setting the bar high. <laughs> Thank you. No, someone. Uh. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I'll be making, well, I was 
trying to get badged on uh, tools that I thought I would use for this particular project, uh, which included table saw, chop saw, um, and lathe, which I don't think I'll be using, but it's fun. Um, so I was around with a bunch of you guys and we had some fun times together. I feel like some scary times, some fun times, you know, it worked out, <laughs> it's bonding. Um, I'll be making a dice tray for my, um, you know, D&D games, um, big Dungeons and Dragons nerd here. So let me just really quickly join the meeting to for people who might not have heard that before. I'm just going to share like a picture. Sure. Um, if you want, we could, uh, if you need a second to get connected or no, you're already, it. okay, great. You're already connected. Perfect. Here we go. Uh, let me just really quickly share that. Check on my end, make sure. So that... something like this. Um, I'm hoping to use different joinery techniques on the corner. So there's, this is um, miter joint uh, with splints. Is that what splines, the splines? Yep. Yeah. And so I'm trying, I want to use those in two corners and the other two corners, I might try to use um, box joint and then the back um, rabbit joint. So see if that works um, and possibly kind of just like put either felt or some sort of leather in um, to kind of, uh, you know, absorb the sound of dice rolling. Um, and if I have time, I might take some of this to the laser cutter and engrave my logo or something like that. That's what I'm thinking of doing. Cool. Yeah, I think that that's a great like scale and scope for a project. It's it's some joinery practice. It's some wood, some wood that you're gluing together. You can try different joinery techniques. Yep. There's a ton of a ton of good reasons to choose a project like that to get started with. Cool. That's awesome. All right, and then James. Um, I just got badged on a ton of stuff this week. I was super excited to just like go in there and play with as many tools as I could, which. I'm satisfied that I did. Yeah. Uh, I have the table saw, the lathe, the band saw, the chop saw, the router table, the planer, the joiner, and the drill press. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's a lot of badges. <laughs> yeah. Um, and every, everyone who is in there is super cool. And it was really cool to work with a bunch of different people in there. Um, and I'm probably just going to go for a cutting board. Yeah. Standard cutting board. That that sounds great. Yeah. Um. I I think cool. And then I'll take this. Uh, lovely across the board to hear all of the exciting things that people are going for. I'm really looking forward to seeing how these projects all progress over the course of the week. And there's tons of cool things to look out for. It sounds like everybody has a pretty good solid idea. There is one one last piece that I was thinking about sharing. And if anyone's trying to imagine the um, starting to imagine the da, 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 sharing my screen. Okay. Starting to think about what your projects are going to be and, and thinking in a broader context. This is one of the things that we thought about to make everything in foundations go a little bit faster um, is how do you make projects fit together? And we did, I'm trying to put together projects like here's the cutting and charcuterie boards. And honestly, I'm probably going to take ideas that you guys have that are really great and add them in. Like here's a here's a footstool or the other things. I'm going to try and like start to add in cool ideas that you guys have for projects that work well. And we'll make this for future generations of foundation students for it to work. Uh, as we're looking forward, next up will be a unit on metalworking. After this week, we're going to hop into the metalworking, which you can hear and have been hearing weird noises come out of that room the whole time we've been here. But metalworking, we've got some ideas. It'll be another week of getting badges. That's going to be sort of the first week of metalworking is sort of like this past week has been. And then the second week, we'll be doing projects. Um, metalworking can be all over the board. So if you, here's four, I, I have videos for three out of the four, good, expl relatively good explanations. Some of the ideas and materials you might need for different projects that are good to try. Uh, and so if you're in the cutting board, charcuterie board camp and you and you get done, you're like, boy, this is kind of big and chunky. It would be cool if it was a side table. There, one of the good projects to try in the metalworking is if you're cutting and welding metal tubing, you could build yourself legs for a side table that maybe you build the top for this week. So there's tons of cool options. I don't mean to make anyone pull an audible right now with that idea. But, you know, if you if you're already thinking, what do I do? 
you could try and put those together. We also have other ideas for the metal shop, like wind chimes. We're gonna try and have this be a document that's pretty built out. Um, like here's textiles. You can see we're, I'm not quite as far with these ideas yet, but you know, different projects that you could do during a textiles unit that would come later and then different units that come along afterwards, like electronics and th those sorts of things. So there's all sorts of different resources that we'll look at. Uh, I was very excited to hear that everybody has ideas. If you ever feel like you're struggling, always ask. We have more ideas in our back pocket of things to try and stuff to do. So that is that is great. And it's also, you know, we did uh, the full show and tell talk. I think that probably we're, we're good. If anybody has any questions or concerns before we go, I want to certainly answer any of those. But then for all the people here, before you jet out, I would love for you to see this foundation shelf for where that is uh, so that you can know where that sort of storage is. And the next time anybody's in the space, just ask. We'll be able to show you where that is and make sure that you get connected so that you can you can store things here temporarily uh, for where we're going. The only thing is we got to make sure it's a shared space. So don't like, you know, take up the entire shelf for a very long amount of time. So that is that. All right. Uh, nobody unmuted to ask any questions. So if that's it, uh, all right, then good night, everybody. We'll see you this week, maybe for the pizza party on Sunday. That sounds great. All right. So see ya.